that only a dozen people are online. We, we don't, we should have 30, 40 people. Yeah. Welcome we everybody to the meeting for March 2021. And to start us out, we're going to go with George to give us the vice president report. Okay, let me see. Share the screen. Uh, see if it works. Yeah. I always have trouble at the start here. I don't know if the host has to add permissions because like, I don't see the button for it. No, no. It's, I, only one person. You, anybody can share, but only one person at a time. I'll okay, shut up. Go ahead, George. Here's the March calendar. Obviously, tonight is Thursday, the meeting night. And tomorrow is Corn Watch at Cornland Park. Saturday is Sky Watch. And according to the weather forecast, which should be nice both nights. Um, Corn Watch next Friday on the 12th. Night Watch on the 13th at Chipokes. Uh, we did have a, uh, well, let's see. Okay. This, I think, is, I, I need to check on this. Uh, this was scheduled last year. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, go back. There's the back, the back arrow will take you back. Well, yeah, it also takes me back to the, oh, phooey, where am I here? Oh, there we go. Get rid of that dumb thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that Nanceman Suffolk thing was scheduled last year. I'll have to check with them. It's probably not going to happen. Uh, Garden Stars was scheduled for the 23rd, and it's been canceled because of Lord Northam's uh, limit of 10 people. Uh, Sky, I mean, Saturday, Sunday on the 27th of the month, and that takes us through March. Looking ahead toward April, a uh, month from today, the meeting is on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. Corn Watch again on Friday the 2nd, Sky Watch on the 3rd. I've got a Cub Scout Spring Camp on the 6th, and uh, uh, probably could use a couple helpers from that. I'm going to try to get uh, my, my, couple, my granddaughter, maybe two of them, to help, but uh, maybe another person or two could help too. Corn Watch on the 9th, Night Watch on the uh, 10th. At Chipokes, and we do tentatively now have Garden Stars again scheduled on the 20th. But hopefully, the restrictions will be gone by then. Um, there is a uh, hey, hey, George, um, what? if I can interrupt here in a second, I will. We go to the gardens about every other day. Um, they're in the process of renovating the building. Uh, the inside, tearing out the ceilings and things. So they've got the whole building shut down. So I think that might have a lot to do with. No, the no, answer. they didn't. They told me the, the reason it was canceled is because of the restrictions. Is it because so, I'm getting, anyway. I'm also a member, I'm getting um, classes that are starting to pop up over there. Yeah. So look for them well, to. By, the, by April 20th, maybe it'll be yeah. taken care of. Anyway, on the 23rd, there's a group uh, called the American Heritage Girls and Trail Life Boys, uh, Boy Scout and Girl Scout Alternatives, uh, that are going to, I'm going to do a presentation for them to work on their merit badges, astronomy merit badges. Uh, one of their leaders was at the last Sky Watch, and we got to talking, and uh, so she's going to bring her girls, and her husband is the leader of the boys. They're going to have about 30 kids there, I think. Saturday, Sunday on the 24th of April. And then uh, Sky Watch will be on the 1st of May. And that takes us for the next two months. Any questions? OK. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, George. All right, next we're going to do uh, the secretary report with Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. You left the screen too. All right, here I am. I think I'm here. Do you want me to go over the notes from the last meeting? No. Okay. 
I was hoping to say that. Guys. <clears throat> I make a motion and we waive the reading of the minutes from the last meeting. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Let George read them. That would happen. <laughs> well, they're on the uh, they're on the website. So that's me. That's all I got. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you doing the minutes, though. Um, next, we'll do the treasurer report with uh, Richard. Money man. I'm sorry, money man. All right. We have money. We have a good amount of money. So as it what happened over the last two months since the beginning of the year, um, we've gotten pretty good with getting donations from the scholarships. About $1,000 was donated in January and about $140 was donated to our scholarship funds um, in February. I've just been putting all the fun, you know, made switch how this goes. I just been putting it all in the primary scholarship um, I don't know what the delineation is between primary and Georgie June. I know they're separately issued scholarships, but as far as money, um, but they're funded enough to issue those scholarships this year. If it's designated Georgie June, it goes to Georgie June. Otherwise, it goes to general. That's, that's how I've been doing it. We, uh, we've had a couple of new members join. We had three join uh, new members this month and three renewals. Um, so money's trickled in. Um, we brought in since the start of the year, about a, a little over $1,100, we've had $330 worth of expenses so far, year to date. Um, so there's 129 on the roster, pretty strong, and um, we should be set for a while. Um, based on our anticipated expenses in the year, we'll have plenty of money throughout the year. That's all I got, unless anyone has specific questions you wanna to direct to the money man. <laughs> The other thing I will say is I'm learning Chuck's spreadsheet, which I've come to realize that Chuck and Elon Musk are the only two people on the planet probably smart enough to fully navigate that thing. Um, <laughs> is I'm learning all the rules. Like a couple of times I've X'd out cells where I figure I, I found out, oh shoot, there was uh, uh, equations in there. So I'm being much uh, smarter now about looking where to actually put things um, and, and where all the, the, the lookup tables are, are from and, where the equations are. Uh, at some point I may simplify things down, but uh, ha hats off to you, Chuck, man. That was a- Be my <laughs> guest. <laughs> but the important thing is you don't need me, you have Rich. <laughs> I love your background. Like Star Trek. All righty, is that all you got then, Rich? That's all I have. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we'll go with uh, the scholarship uh, report from uh, Ben. Yes, um, we emailed out uh, to the schools in the region, uh, the scholarship application, both in Word document and PDF. I sent it uh, to the president, treasurer, vice president, secretary, and Matt. Um, and I just checked on our BBA.org and there's a 404 error when you click on it, so I'm not sure. Did you refresh that. your page? Because uh, yeah, I, I'm I, uh, it's, It says error 404. Okay, um, then if you look into the Georgie June on the web page under Georgie June scholarship, I'm looking under uh, back amateur astronomers scholarship documents. Yeah, that doesn't work as well. Um, if you look under the Georgie June scholarships, you'll see some hyperlinks in there. Those are working. Georgie June. I will fix those in the links you're talking about. Scholarship information. Outreach. I see her picture. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. If you keep scrolling down into the into the literature on that, you'll see some links about uh, scholarship application. No, I don't see it. I just see her picture. I don't see it. I'll fix the links you're talking about, but Jeff's right. It is in that area there too. But obviously, yeah, BBA scholarship. There's some information. Oh, wait here. 
to view the bylaws, I click here. That's probably the same one before. That's the bylaws. That's not it. Yeah, I don't think it's uh, the store. Oh, scholarship application form. There he goes. Okay. All right. Boy, that's hard to find, but okay, it's there. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of buried in there, so I guess. Yeah, yeah. One of you can you can bold that or or do something. I don't know. I'm gonna update the link you just said that oh, we oh, you know, basically put a button on or something. <laughs> yeah, because like I, I saw the thing on the scholarship, but I wouldn't have found that link unless I knew we were talking about. So I was specifically looking for it and I found it. Yeah, yeah. Something like kind a of button. Buried like towards the end of the paragraph, but not quite at the end. So it'd be great if we could just just put a carriage return or something or bold it or something. And, yeah. and, and since you have the documents, it'd be good to put that other one up. That'd be awesome. Okay, but that's all I have report. It uh, it was um, shoot, it was the uh, fifteen hundred dollars and a thousand dollars for scholarship. So we got enough money for it. Hello, Vince. Me. Thank you, then Ben. Uh, I guess uh, you haven't heard anything back then yet, right? I'm assuming. So we'll just roll into the Alcor report with Bruce. Okay, good evening, everybody. So um, if you may have already read your reflector edition for March of 2021, uh, the Astronomical League was founded in 1946. And so is, interestingly enough, this is the 75th anniversary of the Astronomical League. And I just posted in the chat, the uh, Astronomical League Special Observing Award, which is oriented toward um, the 75th uh, anniversary year in 2021 this year. And uh, it centers on the it almost complete apparition of Jupiter that will occur in 2021. It started on January 29th and will run all the way through March 5th, 2022. So you'll have an entire year to complete the requirements for this particular observing uh, award. So um, I had mentioned earlier this year that I wanted to feature at least one observing award uh, per month. So this is your feature for this month. Um, so if you click on that link, you can look through this. It primarily centers on um, great red spot observations, um, transits, occultation, eclipses, and shadow transits, and uh, sketching the motion of the moons, just like Galileo. So uh, as the Alcor, I, I might actually have to uh, get hot and do this one to uh, revive my high school science project from 1981, physical observations of Jovian atmospheric phenomena. Yes, I was a nerd in high school and um, yeah. Anywho, so <laughs> um, also um, I, I would add that um, the uh, Astronomical League, as it mentions on page five of the reflector for March 2021 is increasing its online presence. Um, they actually uh, did a excellent presentation on March 2nd. I don't know if anybody, no, Roland was here for that. And um, uh, <clears throat> they presented on the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, home of the uh, famous StarQuest. And I'll dump that in the chat as well. Um, that was an excellent uh, summary of everything about Green Bank. Um, and they actually live during the uh, Zoom meeting demonstrated um, uh, the uh, 20 foot radio telescope that is remotely operated. Um, and the uh, presenter actually downloaded data real time from the Crab Nebula remotely from uh, West Virginia. It was pretty, pretty phenomenal. So um, those are the kinds of uh, high speed things you can do through uh, citizen science of the Astronomical League. So um, 
they they actually sent out a, a link that's a summary of all that. And Sean, did, did you get that as well? No, yes. Anyway. Um, yes, I did. Okay. Um, I don't know how you send that out to all members, but um, that would actually be worth you know, pushing out to all the members uh, if they missed the presentation. Um, interestingly, um, the reflector quotes that societies that are conducting online events during the pandemic had greater participation than when they were holding all of their meetings in, in person. So um, the uh, mid-eastern region of the Astronomical League, otherwise known as Merrill, uh, will be, quote, exploring an increased use of online resources when appropriate, such as a YouTube channel designed to further expand our visibility. So look for uh, additional uh, upcoming opportunities um, to uh, get involved in Astronomical League events other than just observing awards. They're, they're really stepping up their game. Um, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Bauerlein will be more likely to comment on this, but um, I, I've been monitoring for star party stuff and Staunton River does not look to be very active at all. Um, they're supposed to start on March 8th in four days, but that website I just posted still shows that it uh, the fall start party was canceled. So anyway, uh, not looking too good for Staunton River this month, but uh, Green Bank looks to be a go right now in July. So I already sent in my bucks to drag my camper up there again, and I'm sure Chuck will travel out from Colorado for that. So. <laughs> not happening okay <laughs> we'll miss you chuck all right um so uh, i uh along with george reynolds have closely scoured the back pages of the uh reflector and unfortunately we have no back bay astronomer members that featured uh in this particular quarter's reflector but uh, I look forward to uh, seeing some more some submissions. I know George has submitted for the Urban Observing Award, and I think I'm sure a couple of people submitted for the um, Conjunction Award back in December. So I look forward to seeing those in the upcoming edition. And that concludes the Alcor report. Thank you. Hey Bruce, the uh, eat, oh, Stratton River Star Party, the only place I found it was canceled was on a cloudy night uh, report from the president of the uh, uh, organization that runs it. Okay. All right. So yeah, that uh, that's consistent with the non-activity on the uh, uh, Stratton River uh, Star Party website I just quoted from uh, um, CHAO Astro. That's it, it's in North Carolina. Something like that. Yep. Yep. Those Tar Heels, they run it, but they're not this year, in March or this year. So looks like your next uh, star party opportunity is uh, July at Green Bank. And um, everything I heard at the presentation on March 2nd seemed to indicate that that was going to be a go. And uh, Roland, what did you think of that presentation? That you were there as well. Interesting, informative, and kind of blew me away. Yeah. It's good. It's good to see our taxpayer dollars going for things like that, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If they're doing a breakthrough listen there, looking uh, for uh, SETI signals, uh, they were actually able to uh, be the backup to the deep space network and pick up uh, the signals from the Perseverance rover. Um, and they continue to look for life in the universe and organic molecules with radio telescopes. So, but the fact that the presenter, uh, you know, Sarah Ann live was able to steer this 20 foot around the sky and get um, neutral hydrogen emissions uh, off the Crab Nebula right there on the screen. <laughs> that was pretty impressive. So anyway, if you go to Green Bank in July, you can take a clinic uh, to be able to operate one of their uh, telescopes there uh, yourself and get a strip chart recording of uh, the Milky Way as it passes overhead. Anywho, thanks. Thank you, Bruce.
I also was watching that. I was watching it on YouTube, so you probably didn't see me, but just so everybody knows, if you like the Triple RT, you can log in to Skynet and use that telescope. Like everyone here is, they, they send out an email. And if you want the password and email to log into the Skynet network and put in a observing report to use that telescope that he's talking about at Green Bay, let me know, I'll send it to you because they sent me the password and it's for all Astronomy League members. I, I would I, do it right now, but you could have people that are uh, Astro League people, like since the public can be on here. And you're going to post this to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. R rumor has it the password is I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was very informative. Having that password. So. Um, and speaking of the triple RT, I don't see bird or or Bob. So Bob Gerlin's here, but he's up there. Is he here? Yeah, I'm here. I don't see your name on the list. It's under Robert Berline, so you have, probably have to look a little bit harder. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. No, oh, you were just talking. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have you heard anything about the triple RT? Because I actually was on the website yesterday. It's up. Nothing on triple RT, even nothing from Bird. I haven't heard anything from Bird for six months. Oh, okay. Well, I will give you guys the update on the triple RT. It's working. And they actually they have a cool website, and I included the link on our website for it, but it's called the blog spot. And you can go see, they'll post updates now. So if it goes down, I think they may just tell us that why it's down now. Because they have periodic updates on there. And they got a new uh, telescope control unit they put on there. Seems to be working good because every time I've looked over the last month, it's been up. So if you want to take some pictures, head on over. Cool. Let's see. Uh, old business now. Let's see. The only thing I had down here was make sure you guys are getting your newsletter inputs to Rich. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. When it, Rich, when do you plan on doing your first uh, edition? I plan to have already done it, but I have no uh, input, and I've really been focused on other things. So, no one sent you any input yet. Yeah, I'm. I am remiss. I meant to send you some stuff, but I've been lazy this last month. I'll have to get it to you. I'm also wondering too is how how, how relevant you know if you do a, a newsletter. I mean, it is, it would be nice to have some like more detailed write up, but you know for immediacy, we do have Facebook to put up what's going on and stuff like that. But I don't know. We'll say that again. I'm, I'm in the unfortunately I'm in the spot where I need to start reducing the amount of things that I'm have on my plate than adding to them. I probably was. Well, the we told aggressive. you when you volunteered to do this, I know. we can find someone else. But, I'm uh, looking at a lot of smiley faces here. Yeah, I, Jeff I, I would need some uh, input. Like I, like I said, it would be coming down to, I, I just got to start dogging people for content. Otherwise, this is not going to happen. And, I understand. Yeah. Uh, and we don't want anyone to get overwhelmed because then they like feel like they need to like cut off all volunteering. <laughs> don't get to that point. We need the treasurer. <laughs> but we've been going a long time without having a newsletter editor. We uh, maybe we should go on to the group site, take some uh, put out feelers for volunteers. You know, it's really not that hard if it, people send the input. Yeah, it's just getting input. And, you know, I put a thing out on groups I owe asking for for stuff and templates. I've got nothing back. I didn't follow up with anybody. It would probably be the next step. But like I said, I, I, will, I have a lot on my I'll say I have a lot on my plate. Well, you don't have to give excuses. That's fine. I understand that. I mean, it helps, too, when we're in person because then, like, 
Chuck would corner me and I'm like, you're going to be the vice president. I was like, okay. Yeah, it is always <laughs> easier that way to. Get... It's like a bunch of cats right now you're trying to herd. Um, that's the only old business I have, though. Does anybody have any other old business? Is this working? It's totally quiet. Leave it. Okay. New business. Anybody have any new business? I do. I'll start out. Um, do you remember uh, Zoe? Yes. She's at William and Mary now, and she's looking for speakers to come to. She's in the astronomy club there, and she's looking for speakers to come to the college to give presentations do outreach events. I said, you know, we're doing limited stuff right now. We might have somebody that's interested, but I'm assuming George, that's probably something you would be interested in for sure. But sure. tell her, tell her to go to the uh, website and uh, put in a request. And okay. I, when I, I have three daughters who went to William and Mary and it was any excuse to go to Williamsburg, my wife and I would go. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I figured we would help her out. I mean, she's been a club member for a long time, but that's the only new business. And she had a, he reached out to Leanne a couple of days ago and then Leanne forwarded the email to me. So I'm sure that we'll be doing a lot more, hopefully real soon. If everything goes according to plan, I mean, I think we'll all be out doing in-person events, hopefully soon. Yeah, and they were a month, maybe two at the most away for where we can really start having events again. Yeah, tell her to put Based her in on that too, Rich, since we have Chuck here, what is the procedure to find out for Virginia Beach? Proce procedure to find out for Virginia Beach about what I mean about boardwalk? Yes, boardwalk. Talk that you have to, somebody has to talk to Chuck Dibbs. Okay. So you need to get a hold of Chuck Dibbs and see if he's um, heard anything from the city. I'm assuming the city's going to do something. If, if this vaccine rollout happens as quickly as they're saying, then the city will be doing events. Well, I would. If they're doing events. We want to be doing events too. Yeah, I'd be harping on, on Chuck Dibbs. Okay. I will, I will send an email to survey knows. I'm going to email Chuck. I got his email already and I'll find out what's going on with that because um, that's how we make our money for the scholarship. So we want to be a part of that, I'm sure. Right. And that starts in May, if I remember right. So we may miss out on May, depending on what happens. But if we can do the other months, even if we can do half the months, it's still better than nothing. Right. Does uh, anybody else have any other new business? For the people who are veterans and over over 65, the Veteran Administration, you can and are registered with the VA, you can call out there and get your shots. I have the, uh, both my Moderna shots already. Uh, as of uh, today, I'm one week after my second shot. So I'm looking forward to getting active again. That's good to hear. <clears throat> Yeah, I signed up on the VA site. Um, I'm probably going to get one from the Department of the Navy, but the VA in Hampton is putting out a lot of information on all three vaccines. Literally, Bruce, I called up at 1030 in the morning, and in 45 minutes, I had my first shot. Wow. Oh, that's great. It took, me, it took me longer than that to get, just to get there. <laughs> <laughs> All you need to do is call the Hampton number and then 7,500 and that's the COVID clinic and they can set you up an appointment. Does uh, anybody else have any other new business? All righty. Go into uh, observing reports. Ooh, me, me, me. Go ahead, Chuck. Um, I just got back from Colorado, a week in Colorado, um, finalizing and um, putting money down on a house. But I have a six inch telescope out there. And on the one night that it didn't snow while we're out there, it was really clear. It was unbelievable. I did some 
meter readings as my SQM, and they average 21.65, 21.68. So, um, to give you an idea how that corresponds with Greenbrier, Greenbrier is about 15 or 14. Coinjock is about 20 point something usually. Wow. So it's dark as heck. And that was with a, that was with a quarter moon or half moons. And snow in the ground. And snow and wind. So we've abandoned building a house up on the ranch up on the property uh, because of all the covid delays and the covid um, um jumps in price being blamed on covid our house went from two hundred eighteen thousand to 348 in a matter of about seven months so um we decided to nix that and we just bought a we bought a place in the in the in the town and then i my intention is to this will make Ben perk up a fully robotic re observatory up there on the hill and then possibly um, putting some more up there for lease later on. So I may have maybe to come pick Ben's brain before. I maybe leave. those prices will come down in a few years, too. Yeah, we can put a cabin or something up there so I can go somewhere when what's her name's mad at me. <laughs> But it was it was really good. It was and again it was hard to find Polaris because there's so many freaking stars around it. <laughs> problems, problems, problems. That's a that's a good problem to have. Horrible problem to have. And I do believe that um, Saturday Skywatch will probably be the last event that we that I can attend because we're going to we're supposed to close on the house on the 27th of April. I might get the I might get the sky watch in April in. It just depends if I have all my scopes packed up or not. So anyway, that's all I got. See bye. You can look through somebody else's scope if you want to come out there. That's true. I could annoy everybody. <laughs> I could borrow George's 80. Any other observing reports? I share a Jupiter uh, opposition chart. Sure. Let's see if I can do this. Keep it people heads up here. Let's see right here. Share. So in any case, uh, Cunha is still processing stuff. And if you can see this chart, um, this shows our, our latitude here right between the 30 and the 40. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. If you come down, you can see in 1990, 2019, 2020, we were kind of in this red zone. Jupiter was really low and the pictures were obviously a, a lot of atmospheric turbulence and stuff like that. So finally, we're working our way up 2021. It's almost about a 20% increase um, in terms of uh, the elevation here. And you can see the arch second diameters creeping up as well. So obviously we'll get into green around 23, 24, uh, 25, but it's just getting better and better. So if anybody's still interested in uh, doing any video stuff for Jupiter, that's great. Uh, um, the data is still valid and it's still interested. Um, the, uh, I've, I've shared how that, what they're doing there with the impact detection. So in any case, it's getting better and better. And it's gonna be a great year for Jupiter. Well, I'm glad you gave that update. I wasn't even sure if they were still collecting the data. So yeah. that's good to know. And then, uh, all right. And George, you've always wanted to see this. Yeah, when are you going to have an open house? <laughs> uh, there, it's open. <laughs> That's the observatory. Nice. So, Chuck, someday, you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, I haven't decided if I was, I was looking at the guy that does the uh, pods. Oh, yeah. He's got a 16-foot dome that has a... Uh, its whole design is to be a, a robotic observatory. So the technology is out there and it's, I mean, it's getting relatively easy and easier. They're really, uh, the automation is just amazing. My biggest hurdle is getting internet up on the, on the mountain. Oh, uh, satellite? Maybe satellite or if 5G Ultra ever gets around up there. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Maybe you can maybe uh, put a directional antenna. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, tomorrow you morning boosters for 5G. They're not that expensive, a couple hundred dollars. Uh, you can get a, a directional antenna and booster. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow morning, there's supposed to be a time. Time. This is cool. between Jupiter and Mercury. What's that? Tomorrow morning, there's supposed to be a conjunction between Mercury and Jupiter. Yeah, I saw that. That's early. It must be really low in the sky. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. They show it's it really low. Good <laughs> eastern horizon. Yeah, I'm wondering if is anybody getting up for that? What time I got is it? Three. It's going to be just before dawn, I guess, because yeah. of Mercury. You know, that's such a tough planet to, to pull oh, out. I just try it, man. What's the weather like? It's supposed to be clear tonight. I think it's clear. Yeah. Going down to the 20s. Yeah, it'd be cold Ooh. and clear. That's when it's the best, though, you know. I need to grease the roll off. <laughs> Should be good. Any other uh, observing reports? Yeah, I bought a set of binoculars here the last month. And uh, George, thank you very much for your advice on which ones to buy. I've been going out pretty much every night and having a ball with them. I enjoy the portability and I stay out there maybe an hour or two and I've been having a great time with it. So thank you very much. What did you get? Uh, I got Orion uh, 10 by 50. I can't remember the model name of them right now. Um, it's one of their newer ones that they had. I think it was like 120 bucks or something like that. Not bad. Been having a great time with it though. Phenomenal. Good deal. You know, the uh, ALE does have a uh, binocular Messier program. So that's one of the mm -hmm. observing wards you can get. I know this because I looked and I've done 47 of the 50 that are required and I haven't done the last three in the last like two years. So maybe I'll go and get the last three. Well, actually I will, I just gotta wait till summer. Um, when some of the things I'll be able to get are available. You got a binocular Messier also. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Said. But you could, but you can get some other ones too, some uh, like uh, urban and things like that, and you're able to use binoculars as well. Mm -hmm. So there's several of them that you don't have to have a telescope. Yeah, there's there's a few. Yeah. I tell you what, the Messier in Virginia Beach, that's tough. <laughs> I pulled that off, but that's a tough one. That, that was part of why I stopped doing it. I, well, I moved. I was in Hampton, and uh, yeah, I could get about forty. I couldn't get them all. But now that I've moved out in the Isle of Wight, I'm like, you know, I've picked up a little over a magnitude and um, that I can see. So I could probably go get some targets I couldn't get in Hampton. For sure. Uh, I'm in Carrollton, so I'm not too far from you. So it's not too Oh, yeah, far. I'm Carrollton too. So there you go. Okay. I've been getting out quite a bit. I started working on the uh, Urban Observatory Program, the Astronautical League thing. And I'm going to be struggling, I think, with... Uh, some of the fainter objects there. But I did have some fun uh, earlier this, or, or I guess late last month. Uh, I got out my old Quantum 4, which I bought like 41 years ago. And I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I had given that up because it was so hard to, for me just to find things in the sky. Um, but using the go-to scope, now I've gotten a lot more familiar. It's really helped me a lot. And uh, I've been playing with the setting circles on that Quantum because it, it doesn't. it's still hard to find stuff. It takes a lot longer, that's for sure. But it was fun, uh, and uh, it it certainly doesn't have the light gathering, but uh, it the things that it did show were crystal clear. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. Yeah, I'm sure that's true, and, and hey, I'm working on it. I've been out three nights this week, and <laughs> the forecast looks great for the next seven or eight days. I'm working on it. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to struggle with the faint galaxies and some of the fainter nebulas, but I'm going to give it a shot. Need a filter. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Get a, uh, uh, you, uh, Orion actually makes a very relatively inexpensive uh, nebula filter, and it really works well. Yeah, I've got the, uh, the, their ultra block. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, just, a, just a light pollution filter, even. Yeah, uh, I have that one too. Two, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I love filters. So. But I'll, I'm still experimenting. I got them in a filter wheel. I'm rotating them around to see, what, to see yeah. what happens and stuff. But. Uh, I'm still pretty inexperienced, so I'm working on it. Perfect. A little averted vision, you'll be great. <laughs> Any other observing reports? All righty. Well, 
I guess George is up. George is going to do uh, our presentation tonight, and it will be on Mars Rover. Okay. Yes. So just out, you're about to get educated. Hey, I see Eddie's background there. It's the uh, the lander of uh, the rover dropping down. Oh, uh, yeah. Did anybody, did anybody watch that on NASA TV two weeks ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah. yeah. Absolutely right incredible. Now. That was, a, that was exciting. Well, I've got uh, seven brief videos and uh, I hope this works. It's, it's gonna tell you a little bit about the rover and about the helicopter. And uh, I've got a couple of videos and animation of the landing, the entry, descent and landing. Uh, and then I've got, also got a, the J JPL people talking through the entry, descent, and landing while you're seeing videos of it of on the animation. And finally, I've got the actual videos taken by the rover itself on its way down. So without further ado, let's see if I can share the screen and I hope it all works. Now there there may be some glitches in between. There's a couple of YouTube videos and they get interrupted inter intermittently with ads and I have to uh, kill the ads but uh, just bear with me and george just so you are aware i've got all of those links you sent me loaded so if you have okay. troubles let me know thank you i hope i i do too i hope they work okay i always have to do this twice share there we go and get rid of that thing. Okay, and that's what the rover looks like. It's a artist conception on the uh, planet Mars, but that's the rover itself. And we'll go down to the mission overview. And this is a picture of the rover and all of its uh, its many uh, science instruments on it let me get that a little better okay yep. come on it's massive it's about the size of a car yeah okay now we're gonna nice next to the wheel is amazing we're gonna watch this overview let me know if you can hear it you know mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us. For the first time, we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock 
the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. Okay, those, uh, those particles or those samples that it's going to drop off, uh, I've heard them say that it's going to be pooping as it's going along. <laughs> Mars poop. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my uh, concern is I wonder, I hope those things are secure enough and uh, shielded enough because they're going to be up there for 10 years before something comes along to pick them up. Mm -hmm. 2021 20, to 2031. Okay. I just saw today too that uh, north, of, north of Grooming got the contract to pick up those canisters. Oh, yeah. There's been an announcement today. I wonder if they've considered if dust would bury those things in that no time. Well, here we're going to another planet and we're going to leave all this debris all over the surface. I know. Yeah, Imagine that's us here. trashing another planet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I, I've got the link and it's under the share thing on my screen and I can't get to it. Mm. Okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing and then share it again. Hang on. Okay, now let's get back over here and times oh, no, that's not, not yet, not yet. Go on. Share. Here we go. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly our helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. That's amazing. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do that very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin compared to Earth. At Mars, it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system is just been very fast. 2,000, 2,300, 2,400. 2600. We're sending between uh, 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system. Harley, what are you doing? Having enough energy that's needed to, you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. 
We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we've done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle's performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing even right now, and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk. And none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could be an end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Okay, that's that one. Now hey, George, gonna, do you yeah. know when, the, do you, have you heard when the, they're going to let the thing fly? Probably in a couple more weeks. Really? Okay. That sounds to be 30 days uh, from touchdown. And I have to share, um, I don't know if you know, but Mars atmosphere I was reading is less than 1% of Earth. It's 0.08% of Earth's atmosphere in terms of pressure. And so on Earth, you'd have to go up 28 miles or 150,000 feet up in the air to have the equivalent. And how in the heck they are getting a helicopter <laughs> to fly in that thin? We don't have an aircraft or a jet or much less a helicopter to fly well, up that high. It's that's absolutely the subject, amazing. That's the subject of this next video. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it's amazing how they're doing that. I don't know how they, I don't, I mean, there, there's a conspiracy theory. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. <laughs> no, it's, a it's, it's a big lie. I think it's a big lie. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I'm at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and I'm here to see the first drone that's going to fly on another planet. It's the Mars helicopter. Come on. So, so this is our baby. No way. Yeah. That thing right there is the actual machine that is going to take off and land on Mars. It's going with the Mars 2020 mission. That is the Mars helicopter. This will be the first hard flight in another planet. <laughs> How I awesome think this is, is that. Now, it's necessary to say first powered flight because in 1985, the Soviet Vega missions deployed two helium balloons on Venus. They transmitted data for over 46 hours while floating at an altitude of 54 kilometers in Venus's dense atmosphere, which at the surface has a pressure of over 90 Earth atmospheres. In contrast, Mars has very little atmosphere, only around 1% of Earth's. Flying this kind of helicopter is equivalent to flying a similar helicopter on a don't know, you don't hear about many helicopters at 100,000. I think 40,000 feet is probably the record. I checked. 40,000 feet is the record altitude reached by helicopters on Earth. 85,000 feet is the highest a plane has ever flown. On Mars, the air is even thinner than that. Right, in terms of density, it's 1% of what you have in this room. So in this room, a cubic meter of air is about a kilogram. Yeah, the same cubic meter on Mars will be about 15 grams to 18 grams. So, that's so you're, you have to push a lot of air down. Yes, you gotta gotta get a lot of air flowing. And so the obvious uh, trick, if you will, is to uh, spin the blades faster. It can spin between 2,300 RPM and 2,900 RPM. That is fast. That is fast. Yes. 2,300. Here I'm trying to work out exactly how fast that is. So I looked it up, and on Earth, helicopters typically spin their rotors at around 500 RPM. So the Mars helicopter will have to spin its blades five times faster. But there are some limits. You know, you really, we really don't want to get the tips of the blade breaking the speed of sound. Because then you then have shock you, waves and all And you get all kinds of funky aerodynamics and, you know, transonic flows and things like that. So you don't want to go there. So we, in our design, keep the tip mark numbers down to below about 0.7. So 70% of the speed of sound. Yeah, so it's very conservative. One advantage of flying on Mars is that gravity is only 38% of what it is on Earth. Even so, making the craft lightweight was essential. Keeping the mass of this vehicle contained during the entire design process has been the major challenge. Every single part mm. had to be considered. The entire vehicle is less than 1.8 kilograms, Whoa. So less than four pounds. 
That's about the same as this laptop. The blades are a uh, foam core with carbon fiber layup. Each of them is about 35 grams. Wow. Yes, it's quite light. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 35 grams is the mass of six quarters. Think about that. Two 35 gram blades lifting an 1800 gram helicopter by spinning 40 times per second in just 1% of Earth's atmosphere. How long can it fly for? It's designed to, uh, to fly up to 90 seconds. A yeah. minute and a half of flight. Yes. To me, that sounds like forever. When you talk about another planet flying autonomously by itself yes. in one one hundredth Earth's atmosphere, I mean, come on. Like, that's a long time. It is, yeah. One of the questions I had was, why didn't they use a quadcopter design? Well, because on Mars, the blades have to be so long that the whole craft would barely fit on the rover. Two counter-rotating propellers provide the simplest design. They also generate lift more efficiently when stacked on top of each other. The bottom rotor sees the sort of the more compactified flow. The top one pulls it. The bottom one sees sort of a more concentrated flow. Right. So the bottom rotor actually can do better than if it were separated apart. But how do you test a helicopter designed for conditions on Mars on Earth? What would happen if you just took your Mars helicopter and you tried to take off on Earth? It would just make a lot of noise. Really? And it probably wouldn't get the full head speed either. <laughs> because of how much atmosphere we've got. Exactly. It's like trying to swim in a thick soup. We have a really amazing chamber here on lab called the 25-foot space simulator. And in that chamber, you could simulate any kind of atmosphere you want. You can go to Martian pressures. You can stay at Earth pressures, whatever you want. But that only took care of half of the problem. That was the aerodynamics aspect of it. There's the other part, which is the gravity. We needed a way to fake Mars gravity here on Earth. And the best way that we could figure out to do that was a gravity offload. Gravity offload just means pulling up on the helicopter, so it only has to support about 38% of its weight, just like it will have to do on Mars. And effectively, it was a high-tech fishing reel. So taking a brush DC motor, a reaction torque sensor, and a pulley, uh, mounting that a couple stories in the air, and then fishing to the top of the helicopter that would tug the necessary force required to offload the differences in gravity. An actual fishing line. Yeah, real fishing line. Uh, but isn't that stretchy? Like, don't you want something that's perfectly rigid so as soon as you apply the torque, it gets applied to the craft? Right, right. And we did a lot of testing with different vendors to find out which fishing line had the best spring constant for us. What does the helicopter sound like? I imagined that in 1% of Earth's atmosphere, the helicopter would be pretty quiet. Yeah, you're still at 1%, but it's still real loud. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, we have audio recordings of it, too. Uh, but it's, it's, I would characterize it more like, uh, bah, something like that. <laughs> um, gravity offload was working, and the chamber would pump down, the helicopter thought it was on. It felt like it was on. How do you actually steer this thing around and drive it? So the way helicopters work is they have, um, something called collective and cyclic. So what collective do is they change the pitch on the blades uniformly. Throughout the entire revolution, you remove the collective, the blades will change your angle, of, change attack. Your angle of attack, you'll get more lift. So that's basically what you would provide your heat control, right? You pitch more, you go up, pitch less, you, you come down. But then there's something called a cyclic on helicopters, which basically what it does is it, it modulates the pitch as it goes around. So it can pitch a little bit more here, less here. So it kind of like modulates. So what that does is it provides an asymmetric torque, right? When you're pitched up there, you get that additional torque. Now you get it, depending upon the stiffness of the system, you actually get it with that gyroscopic lag that can happen afterwards. So once you get an asymmetric um, torque, the vehicle wants to start pitching or rolling, right? So once it pitches and rolls, and you're doing it stably, you are now pointed in a direction and your thrust vector now has a component that's horizontal in the direction that you're pitching, right? Mm -hmm. You start translating in that direction. I've heard that initially someone tried to fly it with a joystick, yes. an early prototype. If you were sitting right there on Mars and you were trying to joystick it, what is it like? And it's almost unflyable. And the reason for that, it's the aerodynamics of when you want to command a roll to the left as you see yourself starting to move to the right and you start commanding a roll to the left, there's a delay aspect. So that, that delay effect makes it very, very difficult for a human to try and pilot it. You can't fly this from Earth. Because of the 20-minute kind of time delay, uh, so you have to really send sequences. So essentially, you're going to push a button, 
and like 20 minutes later it'll take off and do its thing and then right. you'll find out. The way this flies autonomously, it has onboard gyros, onboard accelerometers, and onboard camera, an altimeter, and an inclinometer. And so using that sensor suite, real-time measurement, you know, again, the terrain, and of course the gyros and the accelerometers uh, sensing on board, uh, the real-time estimation of the state of the vehicle is made continuously, again, you know, hundreds of hertz, at hundreds of hertz. And then that's fed into the closed-loop control algorithm that takes the estimated state and then generates the correction that's needed at the uh, blade level and then the blades are continuously being controlled. So when you see video uh, tapes of our successful flights, right, and if the vehicle looks dead calm, is coming up and hovering and going literally coming back, you know, the machines are working very, very fast and very, very hard. It just looks very calm, but yeah, so the, the blades are being continuously controlled. That is amazing. Yeah. How will it handle a gentle breeze? A lot of the movies depict uh, <laughs> dust storms. The big dust storms as being very aggressive on Mars. Uh, the truth of the matter is that one percent Earth's atmosphere uh, is very little matter actually hitting you. Always. I mean, you're using that to lift yourself. Exactly, exactly. So obviously, so there's enough to lift, right? But we also need to spin at 2,200 RPM to be in the ballpark of lifting ourselves. We built our own wind tunnel that we put inside this 25 foot chamber. How many fans was it, Teddy? 960 computer fans. So, but it, it, did, it did sound like a, like a jet engine taking off. So we built a fan wall array. It's called an open cr cross-section wind tunnel where you don't need the walls. Mm. Just the fact of having an array of fans, we are very confident of it being able to go at 11 meters per second, even this vehicle. If I had known that somewhere along the way I'd be building a wind tunnel to do this, I would have probably not taken the job on, right? <laughs> How long does it take to recharge? We recharge the whole day. So, a so, whole day at Mars. Right. So but does that mean that you could do one flight a day kind of thing, in theory? In theory, yes. By design, it can. What is the size of the battery? Between 35 and 40 watt hours total. That's equivalent to just three smartphone batteries. And get this, most of that energy isn't even used for flying. It has to survive uh, temperatures as low as about minus 80 to minus 100 degrees C at night. So we keep the batteries warm and we surround the batteries with our electronics board. So the electronics boards also stay warm. We take approximately two thirds of energy just keeping things warm and warming things up to operate. Only one third of the energy is available for flight. Do you have insulation on there to keep it warm? Yes. When you look at the helicopter, right, you have the solar panel on top with the antenna. Yep. And then next is the rotor system. And then bottom, what you see this cube is what we call the fuselage. You are seeing it now actually uncovered because you're seeing the last day of final. Yep. We're recovering you know, for delivery to be integrated onto the rover. Okay, so usually you won't be seeing that. So the center of the cube is the ring of batteries. Okay, there is space between the battery and the circuit boards that you're seeing. And then there will be a shell that we put on called the fuselage shell. And that will close like CO2, the gas around. And so the enclosure itself, we're using the CO2 gas as the insulation material. Oh, wow. No aerogel. No aerogel. We did consider <laughs> it, was in the, it was in the game. It was, uh, it was in the consideration in the uh, beginning. And uh, it turns out that just the CO2 as uh, you know, insulator itself was sufficient for us to close our thermal model. Right. And so guess why we wouldn't want to use aerogel if we have a choice. Wait. There you go. You're <laughs> welcome to our team. Now, before the helicopter can experience the frigid conditions on Mars, first it has to get there. And that's a reminder that not only is this an aircraft, it's also a spacecraft. It has to survive launch. It has to survive launch loads, which, you know, easily exceed about 80 G. You know, because of the vibration, vibrational loads are ATG. Yeah. Then it has to survive the seven-month trip, complete with radiation. And finally, after pulling nine Gs on entry into the Martian atmosphere, the helicopter needs to be deployed. This $69 monocular telescope allows you to see everything from miles away, like you are standing next to it. This is going to be on the rover. Before you take off, does the rover like pick you up and put you down somewhere? Uh, we're going to be stowed underneath the rover on the belly pan on our side, uh, and there's going to be several uh, several sequences of 
firings of explosive devices to actually rotate us right side up and then drop us on the surface. For example, the very last thing that the rover does is it's got us by this bolt, it's holding us, you know, mm -hmm. but this side, then it goes, as to drop us, right? Yeah. So how do you undo a bolt <laughs> on, on a spacecraft? Just blow it up. You blow it up. Basically, <laughs> it's uh, the materials, you know, undergoes a phase transition, which suddenly increases the, the stress in the uh, metal part of the thing and makes the bolt break. Mm -hmm. It's called a frangy bolt. Then once we're on the surface, the rover drives over us. It gets about 100 meters away, <laughs> and then we, we have a, about a two-hour uh, counter internally where we'll wake up after two hours, wait to hear some RF transmissions, and if we do get the, that link with the rover, then great. Our base station on the rover would issue the fly now command. First flight will probably be a mutual selfie. You know, <laughs> you think. This is, after all, the selfie age. Uh, um, so, <laughs> I like that as the goal of the first flight. Yes, it is. In fact, no, I, no, the best time to fly this is at 11 o'clock in the morning local time on Mars. And that, the reason for that is we would have come out of the night where we would have spent a lot of battery power trying to you know, stay warm. By 11 o'clock, the state of charge would have gotten to the point where you could fly without risking brownout on the battery and then you know, dropping the whole crap to the ground. Also, 11 o'clock is um, where the sun would have warmed up things, so we don't quite have to heat up as much and also, it's not late afternoon where, because of the warmth, the density has begun to drop, okay? And the winds have begun to pick up. Now, what we will investigate is after we get the first couple of flights under our belt, I'm sure we will try to fly in the afternoon and you know, do more exploratory things. But the most conservative thing we can do is to sort of pick a uh, mid-morning flight. So what is the purpose of this mission? The Mars helicopter is first and foremost a technology demonstration to prove that we can fly on another planet. The helicopter can take color photos and videos, but its purpose is not to make scientific discoveries. Instead, it is to help engineers figure out how to design and build aircraft for future missions. You can imagine something that's about 30 kilograms carrying you know, a two kilogram science payload, doing exploration, acting like a scout, a small vehicle like this scouting ahead for some future rover, or it could be a gadget that goes and picks up some kind of samples and brings it back to a central lander for more sophisticated analysis, or it could be a completely standalone craft and maybe more than one that are exploring places where humans and rovers can't get to easily. Mm. Um, some polar ice scarves, you know, some sides of cliffs and so forth. So the real emphasis here is to try to get back all the engineering data so that it can inform the future design. Flying on other planets will provide a new dimension in space exploration. An aircraft is faster and capable of covering more ground than a rover, and it can provide higher resolution imagery than an orbiting spacecraft. So maybe one day aircraft will be the companions of future rovers or even astronauts exploring other worlds. <laughs> Okay, next one. This is a 59 second uh, uh, trailer of what they were expecting it to do. George, you ever hear of anything of why they didn't use the balloon instead? Whoop. Did you ever hear of any reason for the reason they didn't use a balloon? Wait a minute, I got to share the screen. I forgot. Hang on. <laughs> Back up. Ben, you were saying a balloon for Mars, the rover, yeah. a rover or for landing? No, just a balloon to put a scientific instrument on, let it just float around in the atmosphere, or whatever altitude it ends up stabilizing at. Well, I, I didn't hear anything about that. Did I'm, just, I'm just wondering why they didn't go that route versus a helicopter that, I mean, is very limited flight time because of the thin atmosphere, super thin. The only thing here on Earth that goes up that high, you know, 150,000 feet is our balloons. Yeah. I was just curious if anybody had heard on why they didn't go that route, or maybe they will in the future, I don't know.
Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And this is the animation of its entry, descent, and landing. Here it comes. That's the heat shield. Heat shield separation. I crane. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, that's the animation of what they expected it to do. Now, uh, this next one is going to be an animation, but also the It'll have the JPL guys talking in real time when it was going down. They couldn't see it, but their telemetry was telling them what it was doing. So let's see, this is going to go another 10 seconds. All right, next. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmosphere entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from the spacecraft and now it's kind of an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. The biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. 
Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of sparks on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. If you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has detected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky frame maneuver. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. Surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. It's job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. It's all fake. <laughs> it's all a lie. Okay, and then this is the actual entry, descent, and landing with video taken by the rover itself as it went down. Oh, hang on a second. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Stop. After traveling nearly 300 million miles at warp speed, NASA's Perseverance spacecraft is closing in on its target. Mars. Wait a minute. If all goes well. Okay. I don't, didn't want that one. Here's the one we want to want watch let me start over at two seconds we are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground okay this is the one where we see the footage and here jpl the navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration jpl watching their the instruments meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of mark heat shield set perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated these are videos uh, actually from the, the spacecraft the to get their first look at the surface Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 km, nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Just looking for a place to land. <laughs> Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Yards. That's the actual surface of Mars. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Remember, they couldn't see this because transmission yes, takes 12 minutes. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. 
TBA is nominal. We have timing of the landing engine. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain and altitude navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky plane. About to conduct the flight plane maneuver. The rockets are firing. Sky plane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. Pretty violent maneuvers. Incredible. MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Amazing. And there you have it. That is the landing of the Mars rover and videos taken by itself, its own selfies. Back to you, John. Hey, George. George. Uh, yeah. Hey, I understand that there was a binary co code on that uh, parachute of JPL had put on there, uh, which came out to be sheer mighty things. Yes, that is the JPL motto that was plastered on the wall. If you <clears throat> were watching the the whole thing on uh, NASA TV. It's every now and then you see the back wall and it had that motto on the wall. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> I don't know if you all knew, but they also put a coin on that uh, Perseverance with had uh, people's names on it, um, sketched in a uh, little microchip. Yeah, you can send your name to Mars. In fact, there's even, you can go to nasa.gov uh, Mars and send your name on the next rover. That's again. right. That's right. I did that for my, me and my wife on the InSight mission. I did that on, uh, uh, I don't remember whether it was Sojourner, the first one, or the second one, uh, Spirit or Opportunity. What, but one of them, my name is on Mars there too. Yeah, yeah. On this one, George, I just wanted to tell you thank you for uh, putting that all together for us. Mm. That was very good, George. It was very excellent. excellent. Now I can go eat some dinner. I had I worked thank right you. through dinner. <laughs> thank you very excellent. much. You worked hard on it today, and I appreciate it. I'm glad you were able to get all the computer issues worked out. <laughs> Me too. And uh, James, I saw what you were talking about with uh, in the chat about flying drones. And I wanted to let you know, I, saw, I was listening to a podcast called Gravity Assist, which uh, it's run by someone from NASA. And they were talking, they interviewed the last one he did was the driver who uh, people that train driving the rovers at Mars. And I bet they have a uh, the same type of training for these uh drones coming up so you never know you can get into that <laughs> uh yeah it's hard enough to fly them, uh on earth uh i don't know if they can all do that <laughs> well when i saw that chat it reminded me of that podcast i just listened to they went to they they went to this proving ground they had set up and they spent a long time there learning how it's like all simulated like they're at mars and they learn how to drive and what it's like going over the different terrain so they can not break the rover essentially it's pretty interesting yeah the the single blade ones at the top are so much harder to fly because they tend to spin um and the wind seems to affect those a little bit more than like the quadcopters that have become way more popular uh so i don't know how they're going to deal with the winds on mars because if i'm not mistaken it's pretty windy there 
So I don't know how they, that's, that's really interesting. I, I just, I don't know how that's going to work. It, it, I'm sure they put a lot of effort into it. We'll see. I hope it's good. Cause I'm looking forward yes. to when they send more spacecraft and to have a bunch of rovers going out exploring. James, one of those videos on the uh, rover or on the helicopter said the wind are not as strong as uh, the movies and everybody else would make it out to be on Mars. Because it's only 1% atmosphere. So. Interesting. Their, their gyros and everything that they do to keep that in line have, will have to be so good. Yeah. They said they tried to fly it with a joystick and it was impossible. <laughs> Anyone see the SpaceX landing? That was amazing. Wasn't it? it did, too bad it blew up after that. I was, I was screaming at the TV. It's like, put the hose on the fire, for God's sake. They turned the <laughs> yeah. water off. I saw that. I, I was going to go close my browser. <laughs> and as I was moving the mouse up, it, it started exploding. And I was like, whoa, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> If you haven't seen it's that, it's absolutely amazing. That was an amazing explosion, though. Yeah. <laughs> Massive <laughs> rocket ship just flipped up in the air and just boom. I mean, it was incredible. But <laughs> Un they dribbled the wall out. I was like, Unplanned oh disassembly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was that? Like? That's interesting. That's like a politically correct term. I, I, I saw that. <laughs> I call that a, they call that a rut event. Unexplained, uh, rapid unexplained disassembly event. Right. Uh, I see the astronauts. I'm going on that. No, I'm not. <laughs> Damn, it blew up. <laughs> yeah, I don't think many people are, will volunteer to ride that baby. <laughs> and they said it worked as planned. I, I get it from an engineering perspective. You know, they're focusing on different phases, but they didn't know if the Apollo engines on the Saturn V would even freaking work. Because all the test ones had exploded. And That's right. Yeah. The first time they launched the first, of, what was it, Apollo three or whatever it was, those poor those poor guys were just praying that that those engines didn't explode. They'll get it right. All right, well, I guess we can wrap it up. But before we close, I just wanted to say I just noted Joe, noticed that Jeff has the best background of everybody, including me. Jeff Goldstein, I believe. No, you. <laughs> I can see the website on the TV in the background. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh you're talking about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. For, for our esteemed. Uh, Treasurer, how do you want us to get newsletter articles to you? Which email? Uh, you can use either the treasurer one or the uh, the new the editor at Back Bay. I got control of both of them. Okay, could could you put those in the chat? I I don't have them memorized. Who's <laughs> got the astronomical uh, time tick? The one of them is treasurer at backbayastro.org. Okay, thank the you. The other is editor. Editor at backbayastro.org. They're on the website too. You just I like Alcor at backbayastro.org. Oh, I never use that one. Or VP at backbayastro.org. All right, Jeff. Read it. Hey, Sean. Thank you all for coming. Who had the astronomical tick mark going in there?